بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم everyone uh, good morning uh, to people in, in the US and uh, good afternoon in, to people in uh, the Middle East and uh, Europe and uh, good evening to people in uh, India and Far Asia uh, I'm really glad to be with you today to talk about an interesting topic the two-stage uh, Miller of AMP how to design it in less than uh, two minutes and uh, the two-stage of AMP is a circuit for all seasons it is almost everywhere but the the puzzling thing and surprising thing is that there is no widely accepted design procedure or there is no systematic actually design procedure for the uh, miller of amp or the two stage of amp and uh, this is the problem we are going to address uh, in this talk uh, inshallah so we'll start with some fundamentals and then we'll talk about the two stage amplifier and then we'll go to the most interesting session which is the practice uh, the practice session where we will design as promised the uh, OTA in less than two minutes. So the, the first question actually is why do we need high gain amplifiers? Because one of the key benefits uh, of the uh, two stage amplifier is that it can give high gain. So why do we need this high gain? And the answer to this question is that we don't need this high gain in order to amplify our signal with this very large gain, but we need this high gain to put our amplifier in a negative feedback configuration like this one. And when we put our amplifier in a negative feedback configuration, we will end up with the famous closed loop gain formula given by this equation. And when we have large open loop gain, we can make this approximation and say that the closed loop game is actually independent of the open loop game because when we neglect the one here and the open loop gain cancels from the numerator and denominator, we end up with a closed loop game that is independent of the open loop gain. And this is one of the, actually the most valuable results of the uh, negative feedback uh, systems. And when we say that we have very high gain, don't think about the output getting bigger but think about the input actually getting smaller. And the input in this case is that the error voltage of the op amp, and as the gain goes higher, the error voltage goes smaller. So we have more precise closed loop gain. And the closed loop gain is reduced by this factor, which is one plus the loop gain. And the same factor exactly appears in this equation where the, the bandwidth is expanded with the same factor. The open loop bandwidth is multiplied times one plus the loop gain so we have reduction in the gain but expansion in the bandwidth and the, the gain bandwidth product remains constant so but the problem actually when we do this type of negative feedback is that we have the risk of running into instability because if we go around the loop and get some phase shift while going in this path through the A open loop and the beta, if we get 180 degrees phase shift, the negative feedback actually turns into positive feedback and our amplifier becomes an oscillator. And of course, we don't want this to happen because we are designing an amplifier. We are not designing an oscillator. If you are designing an oscillator, then this is your goal. But if you are designing an amplifier, then this is your nightmare. You don't want this to happen. And in order actually to, to guarantee that this doesn't happen, when we design our amplifier, we design the frequency response to look similar to this one where we have only a single dominant pole because as you know every pole gives 90 degrees phase shift so when we have a single dominant pole here that only comes before the unity gain frequency and we push all other poles to come after the unity gain frequency we guarantee that the phase shift at the unity gain frequency where the gain is zero db is unity is less than 180 degrees so we guarantee the stability of our amplifier when we close the loop of course this is the open loop characteristics and then we close the loop as we explained uh, in the previous slides so the, the next question is, so how much are we far from the instability condition? And this is how we define the phase margin and the gain margin. This is the safety margin between our design point and the condition of oscillation, which we don't want it to happen. So if we think from the gain crossover perspective, so the gain crossover is basically the, the frequency where the gain or the loop gain crosses the zero db or the unity similar to the unity gain frequency but 
We call it the GX, the gain crossover, when we consider the loop gain, the multiplication of beta and A open loop, the phase at this frequency should be less than 180 degrees. And the distance between the phase, the actual phase that we have, and the oscillation condition, which is the 180 degrees, this margin is what we call the phase margin. We can think the other way around and define another margin, but relative to the phase crossover. And the phase crossover is the frequency where we cross the 180 degrees, the oscillation condition from the phase perspective. And then we measure how much are we far from the unity gain, the other piece of the oscillation condition. But the phase margin is more commonly used and more popular measure of stability. And that's the one we will be focusing on throughout uh, this lecture. So again, back to our question, how much margin uh, do we need? And we can ask the question in another way, which is, so if we have a small margin, uh, what is the problem? What goes bad in our design if we have a small phase margin? And the answer is, if we close the loop, if we get a closed loop system, and we have a small phase margin, we end up with peaking in the frequency domain, we have peaking in the frequency response of the closed loop system, and we have ringing this oscillatory behavior in the step response, in the time domain response of our closed loop system. And most of the time, we don't want this. This is undesirable. We don't want this peaking behavior in the frequency domain, and we don't want this overshoot in the time domain. And in order to avoid this or control this behavior, we go to the frequency compensation procedure. So the frequency compensation is the process where we control the phase margin. And we are going to actually to ask now, what is the optimal phase margin? So I want to compensate my circuit. I want to modify my circuit to get a specific phase margin. And I want to know actually what is this target phase margin that I'm trying to achieve. So the parameter that we are going to use to control the phase margin is basically the ratio between the non-dominant pole and the unity gain frequency. So if we look again at this plot, if I make this second pole very far away from the unity gain frequency, I will have just 90 degrees phase shift due to the dominant pole and my system is condition, unconditionally stable and I have 90 degrees phase margin. But as the, the second pole, omega P2, comes closer to the unity gain frequency, it starts adding phase shift and my phase margin starts to decrease. So the, the parameter that we will use to control this phase margin is the ratio between the second pole omega P2 and the gain crossover frequency or the omega or the omega U. And if we do some simulations, we'll end up with this plot. So this plot shows the ratio omega P2 over omega U on the x-axis and the phase margin on the y-axis. And the, the four common ratios that we typically use in almost every design is one, two, three, four, and these are the corresponding phase margins. Remember these numbers, we'll use them frequently in the lecture. So at ratio of four, we have 76 degrees. At the ratio of three, we have around 72 degrees. At the ratio of two, we have around 66 degrees. And at the ratio of one, actually, we expect to see 45 degrees because if we place actually the, the second pole exactly at the unity gain frequency, then it should be adding 45 degrees phase margin and 45 degrees should be left actually. And the result I'm, I'm seeing here is not 45, this is around 52 degrees. And the, the answer to this question is that the real gain crossover frequency is different from the one expected from the asymptote. So, this is the response of our loop gain. We have this dominant pole, we have this non-dominant pole, and we expect actually the unity gain frequency or the gain crossover to be here. But this is the asymptote, which is actually the ideal response for first order system. But the actual, the, the actual trace is bent slightly below the asymptote due to the second pole. And that's why the real gain crossover frequency will be a bit smaller than the unity gain frequency expected from the asymptote or expected from the, the ideal first order system. So we will denote that asymptotic gain crossover or the first order system gain crossover with, with the omega U1 and the real gain crossover with 
omega u. And if we plot this ratio, omega u over omega u1, if we have a first order system where omega p2 is very far away, this ratio will actually tend to one, they will be exactly the same. But as omega p2 starts going closer to omega u1, this ratio will actually go down because the omega p2 is bending the magnitude response below the asymptote. And that's why actually here we have more than 45 degrees phase margin because omega u is just around 0.7 of the omega uh, u1. So now let's ask the question, which is what is the optimal phase margin? So I have this design knob which is how far is my second pole from the unity gain frequency or the asymptotic unity gain frequency. And the question is, what is the optimal phase margin? So the answer is, it depends. It depends on your perspective. If you think from the transient domain perspective, then usually your target is to have closed loop fast settling time. And if you don't want to have any overshoots then you should actually keep your damping factor zeta equal to one. And this is the critical damped system. So if you want to get a critically damped system, the ratio should be equal to four. And at this point, zeta equals one. And the quality factor of the closed loop system, of course, will be equal to 0.5. And the phase margin at this point will be around 76 degrees. And as we can see here in this plot, the phase margin on the right and the closed loop time domain overshoot on the left, as this ratio goes smaller, the overshoot starts to increase and we'll have an under damped system here. And the critical damped system is at this point. So at this point, I will have the first settling without any overshoots. But if we plot the, the settling time itself, so this is the, the settling time normalized to a first order system. And this is settling to 0.5% uh, accuracy we'll find that the, the minimum settling time is actually not at a ratio of four. It is at a ratio of three, where the phase margin is around uh, 72 degrees. And uh, the reason is that actually being an under damped system is not always bad. If we have just a slight overshoot in the system, if we just allow a slight overshoot, a slightly under damped system, we can end up with faster transient response. And as we can see here, we have almost 50% reduction in the settling time compared to the first order system. And one important point to note here is that if we completely get rid of the second pole, if we place the second pole at infinity, this is not going to make our system faster. On the contrary, it is going to make our system slower. As we can see here, the settling time here is larger than the minimum settling time at a ratio of three. And the reason is that if we place omega p2 at infinity, then we have an over damped system. And an over damped system is much slower, of course, than the critical damped system. And again, if you just allow slight under damping, you will even get faster settling time. And uh, the overshoot here is quite small. If you go back to the previous slide, you can see the overshoot is quite small. If you make the ratio equal to three and you get a phase margin of 72 uh, degrees. So now let's switch gears to the frequency domain. And if we think from the frequency domain perspective, then what I usually need is a, the large bandwidth. And again, the problem is I want to avoid the peaking. And the peaking will start to appear when the ratio between omega p2 and omega u goes lower than 2. And at exactly a ratio of 2, you will have a phase margin around 66 degrees. And the zeta at this point is equal to q equal 0.707. And this is what we call the maximally flat response. This is the, the maximally flat response. And beyond this point, the magnitude will start peaking actually to be larger than the DC gain. But of course, at this point, the system is under damped and will have some overshoot in the transient response. Because as we said, if we go below four, actually, we'll start having overshoot in the transient response. And, and if we plot this uh, closed loop bandwidth, we can see that exactly the peak is at a ratio of two and you are getting around 40% higher bandwidth compared to a first order system. 
And again, if we make an overdamped system, if you completely get rid of the second pole to, to end up with the first order system, we'll actually have a smaller bandwidth. So it is not good to completely get rid of the second pole. The second pole makes the system faster from the transient perspective and makes the bandwidth larger from the frequency domain perspective. And at this ratio, the maximally flat response, the phase margin is around 66 degrees. So to summarize at this point, these are the, the four commonly used ratios of omega P2 to omega U1. And this is the knob that actually we should use to control the, the phase margin of, uh, of our system. And this is the corresponding phase margin. And again, the, the fastest settling will be at a ratio of three at the phase margin of 72 degrees, but you will have just a small overshoot, a very slight overshoot. And the maximum bandwidth will be at a ratio of two. You will have the maximally flat response, no peaking, but you will have some overshoot. But if you notice, actually, the bandwidth here is just slightly larger than this one. So it is not a big improvement, it's just a very, very small uh, improvement. And if you want to completely get rid of peaking and overshoots, you want a critically damped system, then you need to use a ratio of four and the phase margin at this point will be equal to 76 degrees. So now we covered some very important fundamentals and we are ready to ask the new question, which is why two stage amplifier? So why don't we use just a single stage amplifier? But let's give actually a brief uh, background about the poles of the circuit. One of the, the very actually nice concepts that you should use to get an intuition about the poles in your circuit is to associate every node in the circuit with a pole. So every node in the circuit is associated with a pole and this pole is simply one over RC. The R is the thevenin resistance at this node, and the C is the effective capacitance to ground at this node. And when we deal with, deal with the MOSFET circuits, we have a high impedance node, which is the drain node. When we look from the drain, we see high impedance, and we have a low impedance node, which is the source node. And the high impedance nodes means you have high resistance, and when you have high resistance, you have low frequency pole. So you have dominant poles, but you actually need these high resistance nodes because the high resistance nodes are what give you what gives you the, the gain of the circuit because the gain is simply GM times uh, the R output, the output resistance. On the other hand, the low impedance nodes, they have low resistance. So you end up with a high frequency pole and you have non-dominant poles. So usually, we want just a single high impedance node because as we mentioned, we just need one dominant pole in our circuit and we want to push all other non-dominant poles away from the unity gain frequency to guarantee the stability. And this condition actually is satisfied inherently in the single stage amplifier. So here you have just a single high impedance node. And the gain is given by this formula. It is simply the ratio between the early voltage and the, the V star. V star is just V overdrive, but calculated from the simulation to be more accurate. And as we see, the gain here is limited to the intrinsic gain of a single device. And this intrinsic gain, this quantity declines with technology scaling, because as we scale down the transistor, as the L goes smaller, the early voltage also goes smaller, and you end up with a very small gain. So in many applications, the gain of a single stage amplifier is not enough. You need much higher gain. And one solution to this problem is to use cascode amplifiers. And there are two types of cascode. There are stereoscopic cascode and folded cascode. Both of them is actually a, a common source stage followed by a common gate stage. For the telescopic cascode, the common source, which is this one, and the common gate, which is this one, both have the same type. They are both NMOS or they are both PMOS. But for the folded cascode amplifier, they have opposite types. So here, the common source amplifier is PMOS, but the common gate amplifier is NMOS. So this is the folded cascode. So this is a very good circuit, a very nice circuit. And also it has just a single high impedance node. So stability most of the time is not a big problem. It is inherently satisfied by the load capacitance, but 
the problem is that you have limited headroom. You have limited signal swing because if you have low supply voltage and you want to give every transistor in the stack at least V overdrive or V star, you end up with very limited signal swing. So this is not a good solution if you have a low supply voltage. So if you have low supply voltage and you want to get high gain, what should you do? And the answer is the topic of our lecture. You need to use a two-stage amplifier. Two-stage amplifier is the effective solution for this problem because it isolates the gain and the swing requirements. You have two stages. For the second stage, you will focus on getting good swing and for the first stage, you will focus on getting good gain. And actually you have two stages cascaded. So you end up with AV1 times AV2, you end up with a large gain. So most of the time you can just use a simple 5GOT in the first stage. But if you want to get even higher gain, you can use a cascode amplifier in the first stage and you will get gain in the order of GM are not all cube. So this is very high gain. And again, when we say that the gain is large, don't think about the output getting bigger, but think about the input getting smaller. So because we have here a gain stage, the swing at the output of the first stage will be the output swing divided by AV2. So the swing here is limited, is small. So we don't need to worry about the signal swing when we design the first stage. And that's why we said that we isolate the gain and the swing requirements and we can get high gain good swing at low supply voltage. And the second stage is usually just a simple common source to maximize the output swing. But the problem is when you design a two-stage amplifier, you actually have two gain stages and every stage has an output node, which is a gain node, which is a high impedance node. So you have two low frequency poles. And this of course complicates the stability requirements because as we mentioned, to get good phase margin, we need to push omega P2 to be multiple times of the unity gain frequency. But if omega P1 and omega P2 are low frequency poles, then your phase margin will be very small and you have large peaking in the frequency domain and large overshoots in the time domain. And of course, one another drawback of the two-stage amplifier is that you have higher power consumption because you need actually to bias completely independent amplifiers. I need bias current here, I need bias current in the second stage, whether, but actually in the CAS code, the same bias current biases the common source and the common gate for the, for the case of the telescopic CAS code, uh, of course. So let's see how can we solve this problem, the stability problem of the two-stage amplifier. So again, what is the problem? The problem is that we have two high impedance nodes. We have two gain stages, two high impedance nodes, and we have two dominant poles or two low frequency poles. If we think about associating poles with nodes, so we have one pole here at the internal node here, which is omega P1, one over R out, one C1. This is the resistance at node one and the capacitance at node one. And we have the output pole, which is one over R out, two C2. Again, the resistance at node two and the capacitance at node two. So one very effective solution to this problem, the problem of having two low frequency poles or two dominant uh, poles is to use Miller compensation. And Miller compensation is simply, you shunt the second stage you, with a compensation capacitor. You put a large capacitor here across the common source amplifier of the second stage and this compensation capacitor gives a very unique effect. It splits the poles. It doesn't affect the first pole only or the second pole only. It actually affects both poles. And it affects both poles in the good way. It pushes omega P1 inwards to lower frequencies to be the dominant pole. And it pushes omega P2 to higher frequencies to be the non-dominant pole, to be beyond the unity gain frequency, to be beyond omega u, and to get a good phase margin for the circuit. So this is the pole splitting. The poles are split. One goes to the left inwards, and one goes to the right outwards. So how does this happen to explain it intuitively? We know that 
when we have a capacitance across a gain stage, the capacitance appears at the input multiplied by the gain, which is what we call the Miller effect or the Miller capacitance multiplication. So effectively, we see the compensation capacitor CC has a larger capacitor at this node. So consequently, it pushes, actually it decreases the pole at omega one, which means it pushes omega P one inwards. On the other hand, at high frequency, this capacitor will act as a short circuit. So M6 will appear as a diet connected transistor. And when it is diet connected, then it becomes low impedance. The impedance becomes one over GM, which is low impedance. And consequently, when we have low resistance, the, the pole frequency goes higher and omega P2 is pushed outwards and now we can achieve a good phase margin and good stability. And if you want to analyze this mathematically, actually it turns out that the analysis is quite complex. You can find the result in the textbooks or you can use a symbolic solver to solve it like SOLICAP, for example. Although the circuit seems simple, the analysis is quite uh, complicated and you will end up with a very big expression that we can write like this one, but B1 itself and B2, these two coefficients are huge uh, expressions. So how can we extract the poles from this complicated expression when very effective method is what we call the dominant pole approximation. And dominant pole approximation tells you that the dominant pole omega P1 is the inverse of the coefficient of S of B1, which is given by this formula. And Exactly the same expression can be actually derived using another method, which is called the open circuit time constant technique. And the, they are actually both based on the same approximation. So there is no difference at all between them. But the dominant pole approximation uh, gives you another valuable uh, piece of information. It gives you an approximate estimate for the non-dominant pole. Although the, the, the approximation name is the dominant pole approximation, the good thing about it is that it gives you an estimate for the non-dominant pole. And the non-dominant pole is the ratio between the coefficient of B1, the coefficient of S B1, and the coefficient of S square uh, B2. And uh, it will end up with this equation for the uh, non-dominant pole. So we can do some more approximations actually, and see if we can derive uh, these results intuitively without getting the exact expression, without using the dominant pole approximation. So if we assume that uh, the compensation capacitance is large enough, we can actually neglect C1, and we can also neglect to determine the equation, and we will end up with this simplified expression for omega P1. And again here, if we assume the CC is large, we can neglect this term. So CC cancels from the numerator and denominator, and you will end up with this expression for omega P2. So can we derive these expressions intuitively? The answer is yes. So if we look at the dominant pole, the capacitance here, as we mentioned, appears at the input multiplied by the gain due to Miller effect, and the gain here is GM2 R2. So at node one, the capacitance will appear as CC multiplied by GM2 R2, and the impedance is as is R1. So we are done. We got the expression. For omega P2, CC at high frequency will act as short circuit. And when it acts as short circuit, M6 becomes that connected. The impedance is 1 over GM. And R in the denominator, 1 over GM means that the GM will go to the numerator. So the GM will jump here to the numerator. And because we have a short circuit here, then C1 and C2 will appear in parallel. So they will be added together. And now we can actually get an intuitive and simplified expression directly for the non-dominant pole. So to summarize this point, Miller compensation performs a very important function. It splits the poles. It makes omega P1 smaller by multiplying CC with the gain of the second stage. And it is pushed inwards and it makes omega P2 larger by actually turning this node to a low impedance node at high frequency. And instead of R out to, I will get one over GM. And consequently, the pole will be pushed outwards to higher frequencies. But the compensation actually capacitor doesn't come for free it adds an undesirable effect, which we call the, the feed forward zero. 
And uh, the concept of the feed forward zero is general concept. It is not limited to the two stage amplifier. If you have a capacitance shunting a transconductor, and this is a simple model of a transconductor, you will have two paths for the current. I have a path of the current here, and I have another path of the current here. And if I get the condition that may these two current cancel each other, then this condition will give me the zero I'm looking for. So if we have a zero, the intuitive way of getting zeros is to just assume that V out is zero and get the, the S that satisfies this condition. So if I have V out equal to zero, then the current flowing here, I out flowing into R out will also be equal to zero. And this means that the current here and the current here will be summed to zero. So notice that the current here is V in minus V out, which is zero over one over SCF. So SCF jumps in the numerator. And the sum of two, these two currents equal to zero. From this equation, I can drive the zero I'm looking for. And as you can see here, the zero is simply the transconductance GM divided by the feedback capacitance CF with a negative sign. So if this GM itself is positive, like the case of a common drain amplifier, then you will have a left half plane zero. But if this GM itself is negative, like the case of a common source amplifier, the negative sign in the GM will cancel with the negative sign here. So we'll end up with a positive zero or a right half plane zero. And this right half plane zero is, is really problematic. Why? Because the right half plane zero gives you a negative phase shift. It gives you a phase shift of minus 90 degrees, same as the pole, but it also actually bends the magnitude up. So it is bad from the gain crossover perspective. It is pushed outwards. And it's also bad from the phase crossover perspective because it decreases the phase and increases the magnitude. So it actually may hurt the stability. And because this zero goes lower as we increase CC, then increasing the compensation capacitor may result into a problem. We added CC in order to make the stability better. But as we increase CC, omega Z will come into action and it will eventually hurt the stability problem we are trying to solve. And uh, actually, there are many solutions to this problem, to the, the evil right half plane zero problem. And the simplest one of these solutions is to just add a series resistance to the compensation capacitor. This is one trick, other tricks exist. You can find them in many textbooks, but this is the simplest one. So if we add a series resistance and then again derive the zero condition, which is I want the current in this path to cancel the current in this path. So we'll end up with zero current flowing in the resistance here and we'll end up with V out equal to zero. So if I apply this condition of making the two currents equal, I can derive the expression of SZ. And as we can see here, if RZ is zero, I will end up with the same exact expression I got before, but now with RZ here, I can control the value of the zero. So how should I select the value? of RZ. One very effective actually design strategy is to place the zero at infinity. And if I want to place the zero at infinity, simply I will set RZ equal to one over GM6. And of course the zero will go to infinity and we can implement RZ as a PMOS device in Triode. And this will make the resistance actually match it to the GM of uh, M6 across corners. So it can be made uh, relatively process and temperature invariant. But anyway, this is an effective solution. Even if you use a simple resistance, this is an effective solution for canceling the right half plane zero. But some designers actually are uh, greedy and they want to make use of the zero. They don't, they don't want to get rid of the zero, but they try to make use of the zero. So they ask, what if I move the zero to the left half plane? And if I move the zero to the left half plane, I can use it to cancel omega P2. And if I cancel omega P2, I will improve my phase margin. So first, 
if we apply the equation here, equating the, the zero to the uh, non-dominant pole, I can get an expression for RZ, but of course you can match this equation in simulations, but practically you will never be able to match this exactly. This is one point. The other point, which is more important, as we mentioned before, canceling omega P2, as we see from this plot, this is omega Z divided by omega U1. If I, if I move omega Z to lower frequencies and try to cancel omega P2, this will not result in a faster system. On the contrary, this will actually result in a slower system. So at this point here, I'm setting omega P2 equal three omega U. And at this point, omega Z is equal to omega P2. So as you can see here, I end up with a phase margin of 90 degrees because the pole is canceled. So the pole and zero cancel each other. So I just have the dominant pole, which gives 90 degrees uh, phase shift. And the settling time at this point, the normalized settling time is equal to one, which is the settling time of a first order system. This is normalized to a first order system. And as we mentioned, actually, the first order system is much slower than the second order system when the second order system is properly designed. So if we move the zero far away, if we place the zero at infinity going into this direction, actually we'll get better settling time. So we'll get faster response as we move here. So it is not a good strategy actually to try to cancel the, the non-dominant pole with the zero. This actually will result in a slower system, although it, it will give you good phase margins. You will be deceived with the good phase margin, but your system will be eventually smaller, slower. So now let's summarize this point with uh, some design guidelines. So the the key concept in Miller compensation, in the compensation of two-stage amplifier is the pole uh, splitting behavior, which is moving omega P1 inwards and omega P2 outwards. And if we explore these approximate equations, we will see a very interesting thing is that GM2 is here at the denominator and it is here in the numerator. So if, if I increase GM2, which is the transconductance of the second stage, basically it is GM6, uh, in this circuit, it is the transconductance of M6. If I increase GM2, I will end up with smaller omega P1, it is pushed inwards, and I will end up with a larger omega P2, it is pushed outwards. And CC also plays the same trick, but eventually omega P2 saturates, because as you can see here, once CC acts as a short circuit here, it no longer affects the non-dominant pole and omega P2 saturates, but it will always actually push your dominant pole inwards. But when it pushes your dominant pole inwards, it's also hurting the speed of your circuit. It is giving you a smaller gain bandwidth product or a smaller unity gain uh, frequency. So when you select CC, you should select a reasonable value. You should start with a reasonable value. So what does this mean? So as we said, I need good CC to perform pole splitting. And when we say good CC, at least you need CC that is significantly larger than the parasitics at node number one. But if I increase CC too much, the non-dominant pole here starts saturating and the zero starts coming into action. But as we said, we should get rid of the zero using the nulling resistor. But the problem is as we increase CC in this direction here, the, the dominant pole gets smaller and smaller and consequently the gain bandwidth product or the speed of your circuit gets smaller and smaller. So a reasonable rule of thumb or a reasonable good starting point for the selection of CC to select CC something around 30% to 50% of the load capacitance, which is the capacitance at node two. Now let's turn to the, the stability and the phase margin requirements. So here I have again the simplified equations of omega P1 and omega P2 and assume I have a large capacitance at, at the output, C2 is the load capacitance. So I will neglect C1. So I'll get even a simpler expression for omega P2. So these are my poles. And the gain band with the product is the product of the gain, which is the gain of the first stage times the gain of the second stage multiplied by the bandwidth, which is the dominant pole, omega P1 here. So this is the gain band product or omega U1 or the, the unity gain frequency, the asymptotic unity gain frequency. And as we mentioned, to control the, the phase margin of the circuit, we need to control this ratio, omega P2 divided by omega U1. 
And that's an example for a critically damped response, which has zeta equal one, the critical damped system, which is the fastest system if you don't want any overshoots, which has a phase margin of 76 degrees, you need to set the ratio to four. So let's substitute with the equation of omega P2, which is this equation, and the equation of omega U1, which is this equation, simply omega P2 is the GM of the second stage divided by the load capacitance, and omega U1, or the gain bandwidth product, is the GM of the first stage divided by CC, the compensation capacitance. So you end up with this equation, which controls actually the ratio between GM2 and uh, GM1. So if we use our rule of thumb, let's do a simple example, assume CL is two picofarad, let's pick the CC to be one picofarad, then we'll end up that I need this ratio to be equal to eight. And this means that transconductance with the second stage need to be much larger than the transconductance of the first stage. And as we pointed out, actually GM2 causes pole splitting and it causes pole splitting that continues. It doesn't saturate like the splitting effect of CC. So assume we are using the same GM over ID, the same inversion level for both the input transistor of the first stage and the input transistor of the second stage. So simply we can get the, the ratios of the bias current, but noting of course that the bias current of the first stage gets split uh, between these two transistors, M1 and M2. So this will tell us the ratio between the bias current of the second stage, IB2, and the bias current of the first stage, IB1. And in this example, this ratio is equal to four. And this means that 80% of the power consumption is spent in the second stage. And this 80% of power doesn't result directly to speed in our circuit because the speed is controlled by the GBW and the GBW is actually controlled by GM1 the transconductance of the first stage, not the second stage. So in order to achieve the stability, I had to burn too much current in the second stage in order to get a large GM2 and guarantee a good phase margin. And that's why the Miller of AMB is very energy inefficient. It is not an energy efficient circuit, but again, it is high gain amplifier that can work at low supply voltage and it is relatively straightforward to design and a robust circuit. And that's why it is one of the most popular amplifier circuits. So now let's go to the, the most interesting part of the talk, which is the, the practice. But before going into this part, I would like to remind you that we have the ADT analog design challenge, design the two stage OTA in less than two minutes. And we have Amazon vouchers as gifts in addition to ADT licenses and the deadline to register is actually just the day after tomorrow. So visit our LinkedIn page and register now before missing actually this interesting design challenge. So if you want to practice, one good thing is, is to verify your concepts using behavioral models. So I can go to my schematic editor and draw a schematic like this one. So here I have the first stage and here I have the second stage and I have my compensation capacitor here and I have my zero nulling resistor here. And I will perform three simulations for three different values of RZ. The first one, I will select RZ to place the zero at infinity, which is the best strategy as we mentioned. The second one, I will select RZ in order to cancel the non-dominant pole and the third one, actually, I will select the zero to be exactly at omega u, which is, of course, a mistake. You shouldn't do this. But sometimes when you have the zero poorly controlled and it varies with the process, this may happen unintentionally. And to compare these three conditions, I will do unity gain feedback across my two-stage amplifier. So this is unity gain feedback. And I will do... STB analysis to measure the loop gain. And I will also measure the, the closed loop response, the closed loop AC response, and the closed loop uh, transient response. So let's have a look at the three cases. So the red one here is the case of zero plays at infinity. 
and we can see the loop gain here. We have the dominant pole here, and we have the non-dominant pole here. We have here minus 20 dB per decade, and then we have minus 40 dB per decade. The yellow curve, we can see that the slope continues to be minus 20 dB per decade because actually for the yellow curve, the zero cancels the second pole. So you don't have the second pole, you don't have this extra 20 dB per decade. The green trace is for the case of placing the zero at omega u. And you can see that the response is flattened here because you were going minus 20 dB per decade and then the zero comes and makes you zero dB per decade makes you flat and then comes the second pole and you go back minus 20 dB per decade. So let's compare the step response. If you look at the step response, you will find that the red trace is definitely the fastest one. It is the fastest one. Why? Because again, a second order system is faster than a first order system. So the first order system is the yellow curve. The yellow curve, which has perfect cancellation, it just behaves as a first order system with a phase margin of 90 degrees, but it is slower, it settles slower than the second order system because it is over damped system. But the red one is a critical damped system, so it has the fast settling time. And of course, you can see that the green one is the worst, of course. You have in initially fast rising, fast rise time, but you have very slow settling afterwards due to the zero. And that's why placing the zero at infinity, completely getting rid of the zero is the safest actually design strategy. You don't need to worry about problems uh, like this one. And if we compare the frequency response, again, we'll find that the red curve, of course, this is the closed loop frequency response. We we'll find that the red curve where the zero is placed at infinity has the maximum bandwidth, the highest bandwidth. The yellow curve here has minus 20 dB per decade roll off. This one has minus 40 dB per decade. This one has minus 20 dB per decade because the zero cancels the pole and the bandwidth is a bit smaller. And of course the green one is the worst one because again, this is just an unintentional mistake of placing the zero at the omega u itself at a frequency lower than the second uh, pole, the non-dominant pole. So these are very nice simulations, but of course they are behavioral simulations. And when you go to real transistor models, you will face a completely different scenario. You have lots of effects that were not modeled in the approximate analysis we did. So the approximate analysis we did is of course, very important. It makes you a real designer to understand the relations, the trade-offs. But when you go to finding the exact sizing of the transistors, selecting the right compensation capacitor, getting the, the, right, the best split of your current, determining the bias current of every stage, this is not a straight forward actually scenario. There are many, many approaches, many, many design strategies and today we will actually show how we can do this using ADT in just less than two minutes. And the goal is to make the process fast, intuitive, optimized, and fun. So let's go together and see how we can design the OTA in less than uh, two minutes. So I will now open an empty project of ADT. I will start sharing my ADT screen. So this is the analog designer's toolbox. This is an empty, empty project. And the first thing that you need to do is to load the lookup tables. So we have some example lookup tables shipped with the tool. And you can also generate your own lookup tables using the LA2 generation tab. It works best with uh, cadence inspector on Linux, we have Windows version and we also have Linux version. So I will go here, file, load LUT. And in the Windows version, you will find a folder named LT Spice example, but this is not the one I'm going to use. I'm going to use the, the Spectre example. And this comes with the Linux version. Even if you are using Windows, you can download the Linux version and get the Spectre example uh, folder from the downloaded archive. So here you have two example lookup tables, one for N channel, N MOS, and one for P channel device, P MOS. So I will select both and load them. And as you can see, they load very quickly. And now we have the device characteristics, the behavior of the device that is 
there in the simulator, but pre-computed in the form of lookup tables. And before going to the design, if we want to show the effect that we talked about, that uh, the, the intrinsic gain is going down as we scale the channel length, I can choose the, the channel length to be on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, I will plot the intrinsic gain, GM over GDS. And I can do this plot at a specific GM over ID, assume a GM over ID of 10 and assume a VDS of one. And as you can see in this plot, as you pick a smaller channel length, you have a smaller intrinsic gain. And that's why it is very difficult to get high gain using small devices in modern technologies. And that's why we said that the two-stage amplifier is the most effective solution in these cases if you want to get high gain. So now let's go and design our OTA. So this is our design database generation. This is the library of designs we have inside the tool. So I will go for voltage amplifier. I will select two-stage amplifier here. And we have different compensation scenarios. The one we focused on today is the Miller compensation. So I'll select the Miller compensation here. And we have multiple actually variants of this design. So I'll just select the first one. The first stage, it has an NMOS input and the second stage has PMOS input. So here you will have the degrees of freedom of the circuit and every transistor is specified by channel length and GM over ID. Here you specify the search range uh, of your circuit. So I'll just do a quick design to show you how you can do a design very quickly. So here I will save my database. And this database by default has 100,000 design points. So now I'm generating this new database and in a couple of seconds, I have my database ready. So next I will go to the design cockpit interface. This is the database I generated. I will add it to the active DDBs and I can show the schematic of my circuit as well. So this is the schematic. On the left here, you have the degrees of freedom of the circuit. And on the right, I have all the specs of the circuit. And to do a design, you simply need to drag the handles of the sliders to apply constraints. So by applying constraint here on the DC gain here, I can see how this is constraint is affecting my maximum achievable bandwidth. I can see how this constraint is affecting my minimum channel length for every device. So you can interactively explore the design space of your circuit. So assume I want a gain of 1000, which is uh, 60 dB. And now I will go to the unity gain frequency. Assume I want a unity gain frequency of 50 meg. I can just write 50 here. And now I will put a constraint on the phase margin. So basically this tells you that the maximum phase margin you can get given these conditions is just 63 degrees, which may not be enough, as we said, for some applications, but this database is limited to this range of current from 10 microns to 100 microns, which we can change as we will show. So assume I will be happy with just the 50 degrees of phase margin. So as you can see, as I pull my phase margin handle here, I see what is happening in the power consumption here. So this is the minimum power consumption. And for a phase margin of 40, the power is different from a phase margin of 50. The power is different for a phase margin of 60. Everyone has different power consumption and I can explore this trade-off by simply and interactively dragging this handle. So assume I will use a phase margin of 50 degrees so now this tells me that the minimum power is this number. So how can I get my design point? You simply right click here and you will get a menu, send max to tune and send min to tune. So in this case, I want to, to get the minimum, of course, I want to get the minimum power consumption. Assume I want to optimize the power. So I'll select send min to tune and click update here and you have your design ready. I'm done actually, I'm done with the design. I have all the channel lenses selected. I have all the GM over IDs of the uh, transistor selected. And I have CC selected, the ratio between IB2 and IB1 selected. And these are the specs and these are the widths of all the devices in your circuit. And if I were, if I were using the, the Linux version, I can actually export this to a schematic with the sizing uh, right away. So the, the most important thing here is that this is not a black box optimizer. I'm just, I'm, I'm not just clicking optimize and getting a result. I can understand what is going on in my circuit, how this spec is affecting my power consumption. What if I relax my phase margin to this? What if I 
relax on my unity gain frequency spec, you can understand all of this. And of course, you can apply as many constraints as you want. If you care about other specs, you can change them as well. And let's take another actually example. You can also add corners and you can change, of course, these default values. So assume I will We'll use the current from 100 micro amp and assume here i will limit my ratio the ratio of ib2 over ib1 from 4 to 8 and i will limit this from 200 femtos to 500 femtos okay and now i will add these are my corners this is the the load capacitance c out i will add one more corner and in this corner i will model the fact that the compensation capacitance can go down by 10%. So I'll write 0.9 here, which means the CC can go 10% below the nominal value, okay? And here you have the number of points in the DDB. You can select higher number of points if you want, and it is just a matter of seconds, and I will get a new DDB. So now I have my new DDB with 200 K design points and two corners. I will go back to the cockpit. So let's remove this design and let's add the new DDB with the 200 K design points. And as you can see here, I have two sliders. I have the nominal and I have C1, which has the smaller compensation capacitance. And again, I can apply my constraints. And of course, I can see what is the difference between the two corners, for example, here. Okay, and, and go to the phase margin. Okay, you, you can see now the phase margin in the nominal corner is different from the phase margin at C1, because here you have a smaller combustion capacitor, so you have a smaller uh, phase margin. So let's put the constraint on this one. We had the constraint of 50. And here, let's put 50 meg. For the unity gain frequency. And let's put 1K for the DC gain. And now if we go to the power consumption here, IB, okay, now we have actually, this range is fully valid. You can get 100 microamp current. So if, well, what if we put a tighter constraint on the phase margin? You can see now actually we can get higher phase margin compared to the previous port because we have higher current surge range. So now I can put a constraint here and see how my power consumption is affected as you can see here. And again, I have a difference between C1 and nominal. And now I can just right click here, send me to tune and I have my new design point and I can see the specs at the nominal corner and the specs at the other corner. Another powerful thing actually that you can do is that you can paint your design space. So let's take an example here. I will plot CC on one axis and I'll plot the ratio IB2 over IB1 on the other axis. So this is the whole design space. This is my complete design space. So what if I have some constraints? So let's put a constraint on the phase margin. I want the phase margin here, the minimum to be 60, and I will append. And as you can see here, we have this just Pareto optimal. So in order to get this phase margin, I need to use higher combustion capacitor, or I need to put more current in IB2. And that's why I get this inverse relation behavior here. So the orange points are the points satisfying my constraints. And the, the blue points here are the whole design space. So let's plot another thing here. I will plot the, the unity gain frequency on one axis, and I will plot the thermal input noise density on the other axis. So again, this is the whole design space. And as you can see, this is the famous trade-off between the speed and the noise that you can see here. And if I apply a constraint, I also can see the design points that satisfy this constraint. So if I put constraint of phase margin of 60 and append K, 
okay. So as you can see, with this margin of 60, this is the highest unity gain frequency you can get previously without this constraint. I can get up to this value, but now I can get the maximum of this value. And again, I have this trade of this pretty optimal front between noise and unity gain frequency. So you can gain all these insights into your circuit and see how your design point is moving actually in the design space. And one very interesting thing you can do is that you can explore interactive sensitivity and interactive impact analysis. So this is the paradigm change we are inviting every designer to join. And you can try it yourself. These are the references I used in my slides. And this is the website that you can use to get our tool, download it for free, try it out, and send us your feedback. So thank you very much for, um, for attending this talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And send me your feedback about ADT. We want to improve it and make it even better. And we want to make designers happy. So thank you, everyone. Assalamu alaikum.